Hi, I'm Anna Thomas, and on this episode of the AI Show, we're going to learn more about adding Lewis to your applications and some ways to make it better. So be sure to tune in. Hi, welcome to the AI Show. I'm Anna Thomas, an applied data scientist on Microsoft's engineering team. Today, I want to talk to you a little bit about Lewis. Now, Hopefully many of you have heard of Lewis before, and so today I really just want to make sure you guys learn at least one new thing about Lewis that you didn't already know. So let's go ahead and get started. Just a shameless plug for my team, I work on the Learn AI team and we try to make materials available to everyone out there so that we can democratize AI. So you can access all of our courses at aka.ms slash LAP. So getting back to the talk, um, natural language understanding is a really important factor when we talk about conversational AI. And as such, Microsoft's come up with Lewis, which is a really easy way to develop uh, natural language understanding models for your applications. So today I just want to talk a little bit more about some of the things that I've learned over the past year and a half of working with Lewis and working with customers and learning about the places people get stuck and the things people don't tend to think about. So let's go ahead and get started. And if you learn anything or you don't hear anything that you wanted to hear, um, please reach out and maybe I'll do a part two sometime. So the first note is to generalize as much as possible. So if you've worked with Lewis, you might have noticed that generally when you start out, you have a few intents, you have your utterances, you have maybe one or two entities, and you have the none intent, right? You guys, you're using the none intent. Make sure you use the none intent. I digress. But um, when you use this, what you'll find is like, generally works pretty well. Uh, so then, you know, people are like, oh, well, let's see, can we do some other things? Can we add some more intents? Can we add more utterances? And over time, you'll notice things get really complicated, and one day, you'll train your model, and it just won't work well. So what do we do? Um, so Alexei Robsky, who's a senior data scientist at Microsoft, once told me, it's all about finding a balance between the number of intents and the number of options within each intent. Uh, so to try to explain, let's take a simple example. Let's say um, we're asking questions about a company aggregation. So we have one intent called get company information. And the questions are simple at first, like how many employees in Contoso, or how many buildings does AdventureWorks have, or where is Alpine Ski House headquarters? This works great. And then we start adding more company names and more options within our two entities. Maybe we even start adding more entities. And inevitably, it gets harder for us to keep up with the number of utterances and make sure everything gets accounted for and we'll see a drop in performance. So one thing I've seen people do is they'll actually break these massive intents into smaller sub-intents, and that can work really well. Um, on the flip side, uh, if you have too many intents, that's going to cause issues as well. So let's take a very simplified example where we have two sub-intents of find cafeteria and find vending machine. And they both have optional entities that we can see in the red and the orange of location and hours. Uh, but what we can also see is there might be places where they overlap. Like I'm in location, where can I get a snack? Where can I find cheap food near wherever I am right now? Or you know, where can I find cookies? Now, this can cause issues too. So I'm telling you not to have too many intents, but not to have uh, you know, so few intents, right? So what am I saying? Um, it's about finding a balance. And there's no exact science. Um, but fortunately for us, uh, Lewis has some tools that are baked in that help us uh, through this process of exploring what the best method is. The first tool that I find people aren't familiar with is versioning. And so you can use versioning to clone your model at any point in the process. And this can really help with trying out different things. You can see I've tried using roles, using different patterns, using different entities. And uh, this can really help improve your model. And you can even publish to two different slots. There's a staging slot and a publishing slot or production slot available. Uh, so if you want to push it to your staging environment and make sure it works in your end-to-end -end flow, then you can do that before pushing it to production. The second tool is collaboration. And when we are dealing with all these versions and we get to an enterprise level and we have lots of intents and utterances, um, you know, having other collaborators being able to work on the same model is really useful or the same application without having to, you know, the other option would be to export the JSON model, then import it back into another app, then export it and keep track of it. Um, so Lewis can do that for you as well. 
The last thing I wanted to mention on generalizing is patterns. And patterns were introduced back into Lewis in mill, at build, <laughs> milled, at build back in May 2018 and at least in my experience, are pretty underrated. Now, patterns are a tool you can use to generalize common utterances, uh, wording, or ordering that signals a particular intent. So if you're familiar with regex, uh, patterns are kind of like regular expressions, except for um, intent identification, except it's smarter. So Lewis first will recognize the entities and then can use matching to identify patterns within the rest of the utterance. Because of this, patterns can actually help you increase the accuracy for an intent without providing a bunch of extra utterances. So let's take an example of uh, the intent of org chart manager, so where one person is trying to figure out who the manager of someone is using a bot or some sort of agent. Um, we might find in our hits to the endpoint that many people are saying the wording similar to who is the boss of employee. And sometimes they put a question mark and sometimes they don't. And this, this square bracket can help with the um, optional parameters, as well as uh, just an interesting thing to note is that Lewis doesn't take into account case, uh, so you don't have to worry about putting that into a pattern. And so Lewis will first recognize this employee entity and then look for those patterns around the, the entity. And this drastically increases the resulting confidence for org chart manager. So moving on to the second note, um, the Lewis team has also developed several different entity types for us to take advantage of. But there are a lot of them, and I often find people, myself included, uh, getting confused regarding which one should be used for what and why. So here's like a condensed little table that helps you uh, quickly look up, you know, what's an exact match and which entities have some machine learning that goes into them and which are kind of a mix of both. And from my experiences, I just had like a few additional, you know, mini notes that I wanted to share that are often useful when you're making decisions around entities and which entities to use. The first one is simple entities and this is like your go-to default, whoops, your go-to default uh, entity, and this is best when what you're trying to extract from the utterance isn't, is, is a single concept, but it's not well formatted. So it's not like a phone number where you could put it into a regular expression or an email address, or it doesn't match exactly to a list of words like a list of company names. Um, so this is really great to use. It does use machine learning, and it's actually quite good. However, if you do have something that, let's say, matches exactly to a list of words, then you might consider using the list entity. And this is really good when you have a clear set of values. So, for example, like company names can be better as lists. Um, another example is, uh, oh yes, one thing to keep in mind is that list entities are an exact match, which means there's no machine learning that goes into them. And if you have a lot of different uh, variety of your list items, and uh, there's some overlap with some of the other things in your application, this can cause some unexpected results because of its exact match nature, because it's just gonna pull everything. It's not gonna look at any context, so it'll pull anything that matches inside your list. That's just something to be cautious of, and if it starts being a problem, or if the variety becomes too unmanageable, then uh, you might wanna look into turning it into a set of hierarchical entities. Maybe you can break it down, and that way you are using machine learning, which can help increase the, the performance and the learning capability and you not having to get it exactly perfect in your app. Um, another thing that I've seen teams do actually, and this was before patterns, but I think it's still relevant, is they actually, they use Lewis to pick out the intents and entities, and then they uh, used a simple hash lookout to post-process and get the exact entity name. Because oftentimes, when you put these entities into the next process, so whatever it is that your user's trying to do, um, when you pull out that entity, usually you need it in a very specific format. And so, you know, a post-processing might be an option. I also just wanted to clear up this one thing, uh, hierarchical entities and roles. They're really similar and they're kind of confusing to me. Uh, but hierarchical entities provide the same contextual information as roles, but to utterances and intents. So conversely, uh, roles provide the same contextual information as hierarchical entities, but only in patterns. So really the only difference is whether or not you're using patterns or not. So if we take this example here, we can see that 
The only thing that's different is the formatting, right? On the right-hand side, I'm using patterns, and on the left-hand side, I'm using hierarchical entities, but I'm trying to accomplish the same thing. And the, the last, oh no, not the last one. The second to the last entity I want to talk to you guys about is the pre-built entities. And pre-built entities are awesome because you know, they're kind of like pre-baked for you, and so you don't have to do anything. They've been trained and tested by Microsoft, so they're easy to just go for. And the one I found recently was the key phrase pre-built entity. And if you've worked with the text analytics API, you would be familiar with the key phrase. But what it does is it extracts the key phrases from your, uh, your conversations. And this can be really useful in you know, a variety of ways. Uh, one might be in the none intent. So maybe your, your app isn't able to figure out what the user wants to do, but can extract the key phrases from the items in the none intent. And that can then be used to form some sort of follow-up question or can be used uh, to run some analytics on to understand you know, maybe there is something that our agent should be doing that it's not. Um, and just extracting that key phrase entity can make it a lot easier. There's also two other new entity types that I wanted to mention, the person name and geography v2. So if you're interested in those, you should check them out. The last entity, the actual last entity I want to talk about is the pattern.any entity. And it allows you to find, find entities where the beginning and the end isn't clear. And kind of the classic example for this is book titles, because book titles might be you know, one word or they could be 10 words. And of course, books span you know, vast different you know, topics and concepts. So really, it, it would be hard for Lewis to just pick up exactly what a book title is. Um, and so you can use patterns, and this example is more of a corporate example, but you can use patterns to kind of pick up, you know, what are the key signals before the entity and after the entity so that you can recognize where the entity is. So here we have the companies in orange and the pattern around it is in red. Um, so these can be really useful. And just in general, you want to try to improve your entity detection and you might use, you know, the pattern dot any entity, you might use different entities, you might also use phraseless. And, but ultimately, by improving your entity detection, you'll improve your pattern detection, um, which ultimately makes your app perform better. So those are the entities. Again, there's this chart here, and there's also a more detailed chart, which I'll, I'll send some references to. Um, but this is like really important. These are really good tools for you to take advantage of. Um, the last note I wanted to talk about is that this is still data science. So I think it's easy for those of us that work with Lewis, uh, who are more developer architect uh, than data science, to forget that you know, we should be following the team data science process. And if you're not familiar with the TDSP, I highly recommend you know, looking, looking this up because it really gives you a way to you know, go end to end through the data science lifecycle, whatever your problem or whatever the challenge you're trying to address is. And so the first step is the business understanding. And our team actually has a course available for you where you can learn how to design and architect intelligent agents. And we kind of go through this business understanding, understanding the business requirements, uh, that sort of thing. So check that out. But what I want to focus on here is the, uh, the data science principle that you'll typically have three data sets. And it's the same when you're creating Lewis models, right? Um, so we want to start out with a big set of utterances. And these would be our labeled data. So we'll also include our entity names and the uh, intent name that we're trying to extract. And uh, we want to have a data set for training. And that training data set will be directly used to train our Lewis model. We also want to have a validation data set. And this is used to you know, pick between the different versions that we create. Uh, for the best model, determine which one's best. And finally, you'll want to have a testing data set, which hasn't been used to pick any of the models or train any of the models. And, and this helps you evaluate how your model performs on an unseen data set. So this is one thing um, that I think is overlooked a lot and you know, can be really useful in developing good and blues models. The second thing is batch testing. And batch testing can be very useful because you can actually you know, say you want to test on your validation set. And Lewis has this really nice interface that uh, gives you confusion matrices for every intent. And you can kind of see you know, where do we want to improve from here. Um, so let's walk through you know, kind of like a hypothetical example. So uh, let's say we've created and deployed a baseline model. 
all with you know simple intents, simple entities and just a few intents, so we don't have any patterns yet. And after a few weeks of being deployed, we want to see how it's doing and make some improvements. So we can use our validation data set to run you know, a batch test like I spoke about and you know, determine how to improve. Uh, we might clone our model and notice from our endpoints that people are actually saying things in similar ways. So we might be able to use active learning to you know, incorporate more utterances, maybe add some patterns, maybe use some different versions to explore phraseless or other entity types. And you know, we'll retrain our model, run batch testing again, and once we're happy, we'll push it out to our staging environment and run it in our end-to-end -end life cycle. And if it performs well then, then we can push it to our publishing environment. And something important to remember is that you know, training models and working with models in data science is an iterative process. It's not kind of set it and forget it. So you'll want to come back and you know, revisit all of these steps and to improve your model. Now, as your model starts to become more complicated or more widespread, I actually have seen times where it's been useful to have multiple Lewis models at once. Um, and you might even have you know, one or more Q&A ma Q maker instances or knowledge bases that you're using. And it can be really hard to route between all of those sources. So there's this tool, and there's a video that the Bot Builder Tools guys did, and it's really awesome. And Dispatch can really help with not only the routing of your various messages, but determining where the overlap is and you know, the model performance overall. Uh, so that's definitely something to look into. Um, so finally, I have resources for you. Uh, everything you just watched is basically available in a blog post as well, except I've also included all of the links to everything I talked about and the links to our various labs and tutorials that can help you really get ramped up on Lewis and making really effective enterprise grade level Lewis models. So please check that out. And if you have more notes or feedback or you think there's something I missed, then please reach out to me and hopefully I can do a, a V2 of this. And with that, thanks for joining us on the AI show.